For those of you who have not had, I'm Stan Walters. Uh, it's not stand in, I'm the real one. Level one, what we're looking for, our objectives, first of all, trying to identify where people are being truthful or deceptive. How to specifically know. And if we recall, we've determined that people in general are very bad at spotting deception. The reason why we're bad at spotting deception, number one, we look for the wrong things. We look for the wrong cues, look for the wrong symptoms, right. For, uh, what were some of the things in the past that you'd been told were signs somebody's being deceptive? Recall what they were? Okay, looking left, looking right. Okay, what's another one that you've, you've been told before? Pardon me? Couldn't look in, could make good eye contact, all right? What was another one? Fidgeting. Pardon me? Moving around. Okay, a lot of fidgeting, a lot of movement. All right, what else? Crossing If they cross their arms are being deceptive, okay. Hand to the face, okay. Any other ones? You about halfway? Give me five more. Nervous laugh, all right. Tapping the feet. Okay, tapping the feet, drumming the fingers, okay. Any other signs of deception that we'd heard? Yawning, okay, it's a lie signal. What else? Position of the feet pointing toward the door. Okay, position of the feet, body pointing toward the door. All right, give me one more. Stretching. Slouching in the chair. Okay, into what? Stretching. Okay, stretching. Okay, out of those 10 or 11 things, how many were really signs of deception? Two. Okay. Part of the reason, again, is because we look for the wrong stuff. The majority of the things that we've talked about that you've given me now are those signs that a person's under stress. Just signs of stress doesn't mean the person's being deceptive, right? If you're interviewing a kid who's been the victim of the convenience store robbery, is he going to be nervous? Yeah. And if you're interviewing the rape victim, are you going to see stress symptoms from the rape victim? Would they fidget? Would they squirm in the chair? Would they sit with their arms crossed? Certainly. You're interviewing a new person for a job. You've you got human resources. You're hiring a new employee. And they're doing a background. You sit there in front of you interviewing them. You're going to see stress out of them. How many of you got interviewed for your last promotion? Okay. Were you nervous? That's because you're lying, right? <laughs> Were you lying? No, what? You had a lot on the line. You know, that boat you had in mind, right? Or the new Jeep you're looking for. Okay? Or, or the new vacation house, whatever. Yeah, you had a lot on the line. So stress doesn't equate to deception, but deception cues are a form of stress. Our goals first in level one, we wanted to try to identify a subject's truthful and deceptive behaviors. Just somewhere you can scratch notes, okay? We're going to do a little review this morning. And we wanted to improve our accuracy in being able to spot those cues of deception. What are the reliable signs? Because the second reason we miscuse the deception is nobody's told us, nobody enlightens us as to what reliable symptoms are. They're there, but nobody's explained them to us. So we were trying to find out where the person is being truthful or deceptive. First we said we look for the wrong cues, nobody told us what the right cues are. You know what the third reason why we miss lies are? You remember that? Because we develop preconceptions before we walk in. We have our mind made up one way or the other before we get there. That's what blinds us in our ability to spot deception. So I was trying to get you in that level one to at least an area where you're catching two out of three, maybe 66 out of 100. If you could catch that, you'll be doing phenomenal. Because in general testing, lawyers, police officers, therapists, counselors, teachers, judges, uh, the press, the media, we miss 50% of the lies because of those symptoms. We don't know what to look for, we look for the wrong cues, or we have preconceptions where we walk in. In the research that we, I was involved in, in in John Jay College in New York, we had 326 case, uh, samples from 36 uh, felony cases. And we had observers trained to watch the behaviors. We wanted to see every single verbal cue, every single body language cue, and we had them sorted. In those 326 statements, we knew exactly, we could prove which ones were lies, which ones the truth. Our observers had all the time in the world to make their decision. They had all the time in the world to pick up all the cues they wanted to. They could go back and forth in the videotapes, audio tapes, or transcripts over and over again. In fact, we found it took for every two minutes of tape, there was an average of one hour to make the analysis. Now, that's great if you got the advantage in the interview. But do you have that much time? You can make a decision how quickly? Ten seconds? Maybe? And then we've got to learn to separate the intuitive versus the analytical. I, I get a lot of times, you know, well, I think he's lying. Well, you know, he's got to be lying. Well, well why? Well, he's just got to be. 
Yeah, but why do you think he is? Well, he is. Well, what's the problem? We're going on intuitive symptoms as opposed to the diagnostic. What are the actual behaviors you're seeing? We also learned that people react under stress in conflict five different ways to the bad side of things that happen. And you remember those reaction behaviors? Anger, depression, denial, bargaining, and acceptance. It's a nice tool that I can use to diagnose exactly where this subject is on a cognitive emotional basis, cognitive emotional level. If I know that subject's in anger, I have to do something about it. I've got to deal with it. What are the odds I'll get an admission or confession or even cooperation from a victim or witness who's in anger? What are the chances? Slim and none, right? I could be right as rain, but no matter how much I hammer and pound at them, I'm not going to get anywhere to deal with that problem. How do I tell if they're in anger? How can I tell that they're in this aggressive response? Speech and body language tells me that. So now that I can recognize it, he or she is in anger. I can see it and hear it in their behaviors. I can watch them respond. Why are they using it? What does it do for them? Why don't I get compromise? Why don't I get cooperation from them? If I know how to recognize it, know how it works, why are they using it, then I can do what? Okay. I can stop it. How do I stop it? If they're in depression, how do I deal with depression? How do I handle denial? Because my objective is to try to disable the negative behaviors. And once I disable those negative behaviors, I can move that person into acceptance. That's where admissions and confessions are going to come from. That's the origin point. One basic principle we talked about is that there is no single kinesic behavior that proves anything. There is no cue. There is no single universal symptom that works for everyone that it will be across all boundaries. We'll look at a tape later today of a young man named Robbie. While Robbie's talking, he's being interviewed, his hand is constantly around his face. I think somebody had that one a while ago. Hand to the face we talked about. Okay. That's a common lie sign. It's called negation. But he's doing it all the way through his interview. So for him, that's what? That's, that's a normal behavior. He's one of the exceptions to the rules. So you, you dismiss that one. But you can hear the interviewers ask him, well, how do you know which drugstore to hit? And he'll go, hmm, random. Pick up anything? Brand new cue. You'll find out 90 seconds later, he and his brother cased that drugstore out before they hit it and robbed it, or burglarized it. So there's not a universal symptom that is always set for everyone. There are cues that are highly likely, they're highly predictable. But it doesn't mean every single person will do them or they won't use them differently. So we have to diagnose the whole person. And remember, people communicate through four channels, right? Body language, voice quality, voice content, and micro signals. You have to read the whole person. So we do our analytical exercise this morning. We're going to read the whole individual, read the whole person. But now we've got to take the steps to make this an accurate analysis. Diagnosis of credibility that fail occurs because the observer is not applying or analyzing the behaviors correctly. They're missing some critical steps in the analytical process. Very simple steps, but they are critical. And you remember, we diagnosed them or gave them the label the eight C's. Eight C's of, of behaviors. Eight C's of analysis. So our first C in our list, first thing you look for, Look for behaviors that are consistent. Do you keep getting a consistent reaction to a specific topic area? To a specific issue? Trooper has a vehicle stopped. Doing a normal traffic stop. He begins to suspect something. He starts the interdiction portion of his stop. So, sir, you know we're trying to stop the flow of illegal drugs and contraband in our country that's destroying the American way of life. You being a good American citizen, you have no problem I search the vehicle, would you? The guy said, I'm in a hurry, I'm late, you ain't searching my car. Trooper have enough? No. Is he suspicious? Yeah, why is this guy in a hurry? Why didn't he want me to stop? Well, he might legitimately be late. 
Oh, but it wouldn't take just a second, sir. You know, just sign this waiver, just a quick look in here. It won't take a moment. You can go joke with your kids about it. Children aren't profiling anybody. You wouldn't mind. It just takes a couple of moments. That's all it would be. I said, no, sir, I told you I'm late. I'm in a hurry. You ain't searching my car. Well, they said, well, if I search your car, won't I find any weapons? The driver said, no. Would I find drugs? No. Would I find large quantities of money? Now, why would I carry a lot of money? I put all my travel on a business card, credit card. I don't need a lot of cash. Dun, 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 dun. We had enough to search yet? Uh-uh. Well, what happened to your suspicion level? Going up. Oh, but sir, I promise it wouldn't take just a minute. Just a quick look at the glove box. Quick look. It's called delaying to the canine unit shows up, right? Yeah. Wouldn't be a moment. Besides, you have no problems as concerned. And you, I've asked you, do you have any drugs? Nope. Any weapons? Nope. Carrying any cash? I told you I don't carry a lot of cash. That's dangerous weapon to carry a lot of cash. I don't need a lot of cash on a business trip. So when the canine unit shows up, they find drugs? Nope. They find weapons? Nope. They find drug money? Are you sure? Yeah, just found money. <laughs> yeah, found money. Now, our assumption is right off the bat, because maybe preconceptions would be drug money. Okay? Well, we found money. 1.8 million. And bank burglary tools from the largest bank vault burglar in history in Washington State. Close, knew something in there, wasn't exactly what we thought. But we kept tripping over one area. So do you keep getting a reaction to a specific point? The second thing we look for, once we find a consistency in reaction, we look for cluster behaviors. Single symptoms are going to be unreliable. We always look for two or more symptoms in the cluster. Productive, successful interviews, whether it's counseling, whether it's therapy, whether it's employee counseling, a business setting, relationship, trying to sell contract. Every productive, successful interview is found to have four specific elements to it. There's four pieces to that outline of behavior. First thing, there's a period of orientation. And that's the kind of the warm-up period. That's the get-to-know-you period. My goal in the orientation is to establish and find that constant of behavior. What is his or her normal pattern? What's their basic behavior? This is the reference point. I don't care what they're like at home. I don't care how they act at work. I don't care how they act with their family. I don't care how they act when they're out playing golf or with the guys playing round ball or having beers. I don't care about that. What is he or she like right now? So this is like setting your scale to zero. Dialing all the gauges to zero. This is cutting, setting the ground zero point. I have to have that point of zero before I can identify what? Remember what the next C is? Change. Okay, I'm looking for any change in behavior. Now, does every change mean deception? No. Not every change can mean deception. The material that we're talking about, we're using now, is being used by our intelligence communities, stuff I've been training you with. I've been getting feedback from our intelligence community. They're using this stuff, folks, on the Taliban and Al-Qaeda. Now, these people have been trained in counter-interrogation techniques. Guess what the intelligence people are telling me? Stand that they do worse. So the more they try to control it, the more they try to stop it, what happens? The more obvious we're seeing the change. They said, we know exactly where to go after these people. We can see it in their behavior. Despite the language barrier, the body language is the same. The interpreters, when we hear the words, it's the same words. We can tell exactly where the issues are. We can tell the target spots. We can tell the cohorts. We can tell where they're reacting to who the leaders are. They're using on Khalid. The guy's been giving up information about September 11th. Masawi. So we can read it. It's the change in behavior that at least tells us that's the target issue so that we don't waste time on other points. We know to go right there. And that's where you carry our dialogue at. Now, change will be one of three things. Change falls into three, categ three categories. It can be a brand new behavior you have not observed from that person before. It could be a new physical behavior. It could be a new facial expression. It could be a new verbal cues. It could be a combination of those two. But something unique about what they have not been doing previously. 
suddenly they start uh, talking uh, uh, more clearly when they've been talking like Porky Pig until then. Or then their speech does break down at that specific point. Or the volume gets higher. Or the pitch gets higher. Or they become more physically active. You see a lot of physical gestures. Or the physical behavior stops. A change can be also something that disappears. Don't forget that. I have, um, I got a six-year-old granddaughter. And I can always tell when Jordan would try to cover up something. Jordan's very active, very creative. I don't know where she got that from. Right. Big talker, big ham, camera ham like you wouldn't believe. But I asked her about who wrote on the footstool. We have brand new leather furniture and someone put a nice big capital A right in the middle of our footstool. Black indelible felt marker. So I asked Jordan, said, Jordan, do you know who wrote on Peepaw's footstool? Well, what did I get from her? The child was very active. A lot of gestures. What did Jordan do? <laughs> Grandma did it. <laughs> So behavior stopped for that period of time. That change in pattern tells me this is the hot issue. How did the cat have all its hair get cut off its back? I don't know. Do we know who did it? Yeah. We also have to be conscious of the fact that our behavior can also contaminate the subject's behavior. This is the sixth C in your list. We're going to talk a great deal about the effects of preconceptions and contaminations by the interviewer. We're going to work today on a large block of false confessions. This is a huge target area. There are some very common symptoms, common behaviors that demonstrate that exist when a false confession occurs. How do I know when I'm getting the truth? Are you contaminating your subject's behavior? I'll show you what happens in contamination. Contamination usually occurs because the interviewer has developed some form of preconception. So I know that begins with a P, but it is my list, right? So now you've got seven C's. You've got consistent, clusters, constant, change, contradiction, contamination, preconception. I'm going to show you three cases involving false confessions. And you tell me if the interviewers had developed self-blinding preconceptions before they walked in. And the sad part is, when they were doing it, they couldn't see it themselves. They didn't realize... Now, it, it doesn't have to be a prejudice. It can be, obviously. But we get locked into this point of what we think happened... And we direct our interview in a conversation only one specific direction, and we're missing the other symptoms. Preconceptions blind us to seeing other clusters. Now, the way to avoid the flaws and mistakes in the interviews and a diagnosis, the new employee, the transfer, incident, victim, witness, is the seven C's and one final step we're going to call the cross-check. Five steps to the cross-check process. Make sure that we've made a good analytical diagnosis versus an intuitive diagnosis. Intuitive diagnosis is more likely to generate contamination and preconceptions than anything else. First part of your self-examination, your self-test. Did I find the constant? Did I take that moment or two? It doesn't have to be long. Did it take those couple of moments, just, um, uh, just a few seconds, to get a sense of what this person's baseline of behavior is? Without that reference point of baseline, I will not be able to diagnose what? Change. Contradiction. Right. Can I name the timely, consistent changes I saw in clusters? I'm, I'm going to try to get you to uh, avoid and discipline yourself to start saying, I think this subject's being deceptive about that issue because when I asked this, here's what I got. I saw these behaviors, they're clusters, and they only happened at this point. So can I name? Tell me what they were. I think he's being deceptive because I picked up aversion behaviors, because I had negation behaviors, because I got contradiction cues right here. I saw performance cues. This is what it was. And so that is why I believe this is the target area. 
Time to consistent changes seen in clusters. Were there any preconceptions? Have I blinded myself with preconceptions about the way I thought this case was going to turn out? But what I thought was going on, what I believed was happening, and did that blind me? Let me give an example of, of bad preconceptions. Everybody remember the Gary Condit case? Gary Condit. Chandra Levy. Okay. Bunch of these people in the country believe what about Condit and Chandra, and Chandra Levy? And still, th still some think it. He killed her. He had to kill her. He's lying. A acquaintance of mine, a friend, is a polygraph examiner with the FBI. He was one of their counterintelligence polygraph examiners. Taught the whole counterintelligence section. Trainer in the area. Had just retired. He got hired by Condit's attorney to polygraph him. Barry ran the polygraph and said, hey, this guy didn't kill her. He didn't kill her. He doesn't know who killed her. He doesn't know where she is. And everybody said what? Right then about Barry. He got bought. Defense bought him. Yeah, he'd become a hit man now. Okay? He sold out. Then you watch, it was like uh, maybe two weeks later, the interview of Condit by um, Connie Chung. And you sit there and watch the interview. First thing out of the starting box, the first question she asked, did you kill her? You remember that interview? You know why you don't remember? Why it's fuzzy? Because it was on Thursday, September the 6th, 2001. What's the next Tuesday? September 11th. Something else was in her conscience at the time, wasn't it? Right. When Connie interviewed him, did you kill her? You don't see, you, you just, no. Do you know where she is? No. Did you have her kill? No. But later in the interview, she asked him, were you going to leave your wife for her? No. Was she pregnant? No. Did you tell her you were going to marry her? No. Turned out, what? Connor didn't kill her. They have a serial murderer rapist in, in D.C. in custody now that's suspected of her murder. They're trying to link the forensic evidence to him. Connor was just the world's most unluckiest flander at the moment. He got caught. What did he react to? Pregnant, marriage, leave your wife. When he asked him the murder question, there was no reaction. But everybody wanted to be, wants to believe what? He had to have killed her. So preconceptions are blinding people from seeing what's going on. So are there preconceptions that are preventing us from making as best we can an objective analysis? If you can do this, if you found the constant and you can name the timely consistent changes you saw in clusters, you're neutralizing the risk of a preconception interview.